Amen. I appreciate that song. Well, I got wonderful news. The pandemic is over, going to be over in a matter of days, maybe even today. Y'all didn't hear the news. Did anybody hear the news? Why? The Pope's going to pray and ask God to take it away. Hey, I know we're laughing, but that's that made news. It's uh, I don't know if it's made the headline news. How many of you read that? Yeah, I got a, I got it sent to my phone, and oh my my my! Now it wouldn't surprise me a bit if uh, if if it just all flies away, you know, just just goes away. Everything goes away because it's been planned. And well, that's what I was just. That was my thought. Okay. Why did he have to have me so many millions of people to die before he prayed? Well, I'm grateful. Well, it's just a fact. You know, I'm grateful God's people are praying. And uh, if it does end as far as the physical virus, I know it's because of God's people's been praying. Amen. I trust you've had a wonderful Christmas. Amen. I hope you did with your family. Looking for a wonderful new year. Almost like a spring day out today, isn't it? And uh, I mean, I'm telling you, it's a good, be a good time to press and wash a house or something. But uh, maybe soon we'll have some. I'm like Brother Marty. I'm holding out. We normally get our snowy weather if we get it in February or March anyway. So, but I, I hope you had a wonderful Christmas and I, uh, you will have a wonderful f uh, New Year with your family. Amen. If you have your Bible, Psalm chapter 71. Psalm 71. Every now and then, preachers will... Uh, at least me, I can't speak for the rest of them, but they'll just preach where they're doing their devotional reading, and that's what I'm going to do this morning. And uh, don't forget tonight, we'll be back at 445 for those of you that are visiting. Uh, we've uh, just come in and changed the time to 445. We'll have our prayer and go straight into our service. Amen. And uh, somebody said, let's do it at 4 o'clock. Amen. No. But... <laughs> 445, we'll have a prayer and go straight into service. If you can be back here, we'd sure appreciate that. And I know the Lord would honor it. Amen. But in Psalm chapter 71, I want to draw your attention just to a few verses. We'll just read verse 1 through 3 and just see where the Lord goes with this thing. The Bible said, In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be put to confusion. Deliver me in thy righteousness, watch this one, and cause me to escape. Incline thine ear unto me and save me. Be thou my, be thy, be thou my strong habitation, whereunto I continually resort. Thou hast given commandment to save me. For thou art my rock and my fortress. I want to draw two words out of verse 1 and verse 3, I believe it is. And I want to preach on how to escape confusion. Amen. How to escape confusion. Father, we love you today. Uh, we are grateful for your kindness, your goodness to us. Thank you for the faithfulness of your people. And Lord, if we've ever needed help in confusing times, it's in this day and time. I am so glad and grateful for my salvation. Amen. And Lord, I know there's a lot that I do not know, but I know you hold my future in your hand. You hold eternity in your hand. Nothing escapes thee this morning. Nothing surprises thee. But by thy sovereign hands, everything is controlled or allowed. Through thy will. We love you for it, Lord. Help us now. Bless thy servant as we delve into the scriptures. And I pray and ask you, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts. We'll love you for it. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Confusion. What does it mean, preacher? Well, it doesn't mean what you think it means in this text. A little, it has a little meaning of being confused or maybe not knowing right from wrong or what to do. But let me give you this meaning here. Confusing simply means lack of understanding or uncertainty. Uh, lack, or you will, of being bewildered. Uh, he, he put uh, the word means clear in one's mind about something. 
But the overall root meaning means delayed shame. In other words, if we're not careful about choices in life, you and I will make long, lifelong decisions, and we're not even aware of it at time, just through our daily habits, we'll make decisions that will have lifelong effects. Now look, I'm not going to give you details on those that I know personally, uh, but I challenge you to do something in your own research. You can go to the library, you can pull it up through Google and find this out. I'm finding out a lot of tragedies, the one I'm going to refer to, and I'm not going to go into detail about it, uh, I'm very much firsthand aware of. Did you know what? We ought to be making right choices in life. And the problem is, many times people who are really good people, uh, I personally believe some of them are even Christians, have, have saved, they're saved, but they make the wrong choices in life. And when they make the wrong choices in life, delayed shame comes to their life. Or if you will, uh, the word also means to be pale. You know what it means to be pale? You look at somebody and they get pale and say, hey, you look sickly. Well, why do you look sickly? Well, you ate some raw, raw ham or some spoiled ham. Y'all pray for me. I just ain't got that smoking that ham down yet, man. It's too, I still ain't got all that tough ham, man. Uh, but uh, if you eat something bad, it makes you look pale. You made a bad choice. You made a wrong decision in life. Did you know this? I did a personal study on tragedies in the lives of people. One of them was a personal friend. And I, I found out to this. Do you know most of the time, now I didn't say all the time, I said go study it yourself. A lot of the times tragedies and misfortunes happen are when people are out of God's house. I read recently, and it was bothering me. You ever had something churn in your stomach? I, 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 I knew of a, a case recently where there was a tragedy, and it, there was a, it, was, it was really bad. It really was. And I thought, well, what happened? What, what happened? And I'll tell you this. The person in this situation made one choice to go to a bar rather than the house of God on Sunday night. On Wednesday night, rather, I'm sorry. And I thought about that. How do Christians make such foolish choices, such shameful choices? Why? How does this happen? God forbid that I sit back and get full of pride and said, well, I'll never make a bad choice or I'll never do. We've all made bad choices. But he uses the word here, confusion. It simply means lack of understanding uh, in times of danger are in important times and what what David is saying here is this when there's dangerous times when there are critical times in my life God help me to escape from the confusion that comes with I say we don't think about this we ought to if we we really stayed in our Bible uh, we ought to be willing to know and, and, and willing to accept. God said, we have an adversary walking about seeking whom he may devour. And you and I don't need to be lifted up with pride and think, well, we're protected by God. He can never get to us unless God allows him. That's a truth. But at the same time, God allowed uh, Satan to touch Job's life, friend. Who in the world am I compared to Job? Amen. Uh, there are times that we don't even realize it. We're making choices and there could be, I didn't say there was always, there could be lifelong regrettable results coming from simple choices that you and I make. Our phone rung the other day and I pray for me, Wednesday we'll be in a funeral uh, and uh, my heart goes out to this uh, young man and his family. 21-year-old uh, girl, 20-year-old girl riding down the road with her 10-month-old baby. They're in eternity. I'll, I'll attend the funeral uh, Wednesday. You know, folk, life is fragile. And it's fast. 
Have you ever noticed how fast life is? I sit back at Christmas today and I, I was looking and, and just thinking about, man, I, I remember when these kids, some of them 18 when they were born. And, and, and time is flying by so rapidly. And I sit there and I noticed how our family conducted Christmas. And I was so grateful for what has been instilled in our family. And I'll tell my father, thank you for doing God's will. Thank you for attending church. Thank you for influencing me. I mean that from the bottom of my heart. And not just my father-in-law, my mother-in-law. Hey, we've always, I, I can't remember a time uh, that Christmas after we got right with God and say that we didn't do the right thing around the house. Amen? I'm grateful for the right choices. I wonder, I was sitting there looking at some of the older uh, grandchildren, I thought to myself, my, 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 boy, if I wouldn't have got right with God, Mark, I probably wouldn't even be here. My, my little wife would be sitting here brokenhearted. But you know what? God saved me, and when he did, he got me out of the bars, friend. He got me out of making foolish decisions and got me in the house of God. David is saying this, because I am a Christian, I can escape from confusion and David's giving us reasons why he's able to escape from confusion this delayed shame if you will this disappointment sometimes it's a lack of understanding and sometimes it's financial circumstances sometimes it's dangerous circumstances sometimes it's just having an uncertainty about the future, not knowing what's going to go on or how things are going to... I know people just bite their nails off, not knowing what's going to take place in the future. Man, God's not in that. Let me tell you why. God is not the author of confusion. If you're going through a time and it's confusion involved, let me say this, mark it down, bank on it, God's not in it. God is not the author of confusion. God's never going to delve or, or allow you to delve in his will and get in his will and you be confused about what you're doing. Our God is a God that owns a cattle on a thousand hills. His lips still move. His heart's still awake. And he's very much capable of allowing you and I to know what his will is. God loves us. And God's not in the confusion business, friend. He don't confuse his children about making decisions. God gives you and I peace and guidance. The Holy Spirit of God's our guide, the paraclete. He's the one that helps you and I realize that we've made a, have you ever made a godly decision? Have you ever made a decision you've walked away and you say, man, I am so glad that I read my Bible. I'm so grateful that I prayed and I made the right decision. God was in this and you sit back and you just tell the Lord, thank you. I'm so grateful for what you've allowed me to consult you and not only to come to you, but you have allowed me to escape confusion which can have vital results. Uh, sometime, friend, look here. Oh, well, I did a oops. I did a I'm sorry. Well, we all do that. I didn't say uh, I didn't. I said we all do that. But God expects you and I to get to a stage of maturity to have some confidence in what's going to take place in my life and yours and some certainty. I promise you, friend, listen, I can't, I'm not saying that we know the future by any means, but we can know part of it. God holds our future in his hand. Nothing's coming in my life unless God allows it. He loves you and I. He's purchased that right with his blood at Calvary, and the Lord wants you and I to escape confusion. He don't want delayed shame in your life. What do you mean, preacher? I'm talking about we make decisions that affect innocent people. Mm -mm -mm. We make decisions that affect our family, our loved ones, innocent people. God, God's not in that. And the Lord comes here and David says this. He said, I know how to escape confusion. 
Well, man, I tell you what, if he knows how to do it, I sure want to know, right? It's simple Bible doctrine like he was talking about this morning. Simple Bible doctrine. Did you know what? You'll never open this book up and read something that's going to harm you. I had little Kenna come down this the other day, and she said, Pappy, she said, I got a question. I said, all right, far away. She said, why is it that some people, some Christians don't believe the Bible, and they say that it's not all true? And I thought, well, where in the world did she hear this from? And she said, how would you answer, listen to this, a sinner, she said, that don't believe the Bible? She said, Pappy, what would you say if, if a sinner come to you and said the Bible's not true? I'm sitting there, boy, and <laughs> it's just like the Holy Spirit of God hovered around my chair and said, you better have a good answer here, son. <laughs> I didn't know what else to say to her, but this Chuck, I told her, I said, well, I can tell you what I say. And she said, what's that? I said, well, I went to get my eyeglasses here a little while back, and this fellow evidently was brought up into... Uh, some kind of doctrine. I don't know what it was. It was terrible doctrine, though, I guess. Anything leads you from God's words, horrible. It's harmful for you. And the fellow sit there, and we got talking about the Bible. And I asked him, I said, sir, do you believe the Bible? He said, well, he said, uh, if you mean, is it mistake-free? Is it perfect? He said, no, I don't. I said, okay. I said, you're entitled to believe that. He said, what about you? I said, well, I got a proposition for you. He was telling me that his family, was, his theology he was telling me about, I'm not going to go into all that, but it, they knew a lot of background, a lot of history. And I told him, I said, the same thing I told him is what I told Kenna, by the way. I said, do you know how many men died to where we could have this Bible? He said, yeah, I'm, he said, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of the history. He said, but that doesn't prove that it's perfect. I said, do you believe in God? He said, oh, absolutely. I said, so you believe in a God that's not capable of preserving and seeing to it that his word is perfect? He said, no, I didn't say that. I said, no, you, you really are saying that if you don't believe it. He said, no, I'm not saying that. I said, let me go a little further. I said, excuse me a minute. I said, let me run out here to my truck. I said, I'm going to write you a check. What's your name? He told me, I said, I'm going to write you a check for $5,000. And you're welcome to sign that check and take it to the bank the minute I leave. If you can show me one mistake, listen, in the King James Bible. Folks, that's why we don't use no other perversion. Perversion. He got quiet. I said, I am serious. I said, I'll cut you a check today. I said, you don't have to show me a handful of mistakes. I said, just show me one. Oh, no, you took me wrong. I'm not saying there's flaws in the Bible. You know what? Don't be too quick to blame other people for not having the faith in the Scriptures when you and I sometimes don't know how to defend the Scriptures. And I looked at my granddaughter and said, let me tell you something, honey. I said, that book right there is flawless. Do you know what that word means? It's perfect. And I said, they can't nobody show you any different. And if you run across them, Pappy's got a check for five grand if they can show you where there's a mistake. Now to have something so precious and so valuable, David said this. First thing he tells us is this. You can escape this kind of confusion, this kind of shame, this kind of delayed fusion and it all has to do with where you resort in life. It's in the text. Look at the text. Read it with me. Psalm 71. In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be put to confusion. 
Deliver me in thy righteousness, and cause me to escape. Incline thine ear unto, my, unto me, and save me. Uh, be thou my strong habitation. Watch it. Whereunto I may continually resort. Amen. Do you know what that word means? This means a general visiting. Amen. Now I got a question for you. How long has it been since you have been in God's presence? I'm not talking about coming to church. I'm not talking about coming to Sunday school. I mean there's a time, friend, when you've been in the general assembly of Almighty God and you knew God was speaking to your heart. David said, I've learned to resort. To thy habitation. Now the meaning is this. When you get the habit of meeting with God. And I get the habit of meeting with God. We escape confusion. We escape confusion. Psalm 91 reads it this way. Let's just look there real quick. The general assembly of God. Look at the promise that God gives you and I if we seek his presence, if we look after him. Look what he says. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High, watch it, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I will trust. Surely he will deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from noise and pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield. Brother Marty, search for me a song by the Roots, R-U-P-P-S, entitled Under His Wings, please. Do you know God Wants you and I in his presence. I want to ask you a question, friend. When is the last time you've walked away from your prayer place, your prayer closet, or your personal studies, and you knew without a shadow of a doubt you hadn't just prayed, you hadn't just read a text, but you've been near God. You know where his habitation is listen to me it's in the word of God and it's in the word and it's in prayer but I'll tell you there's somewhere else there it's in the life of his son Amen. let me ask you a question how well this morning do we know Christ how well do we know him I want to ask you, think about that before you answer that in your mind. Right now, if you were on a, in a court of law and you were supposed to be convicted for your, uh, for your knowledge of, how, of the Savior and you had to describe the Lord Jesus to a lost and dying audience, how well do we know him? Because, see, I'm going to promise you something. You get around him, and there's no doubt about it. You're in God's habitation. Just follow him and his ways. Just come up close to him. How long's it been, friend, since you have been with God's son? You've prayed and you've given him. I'm not talking about salvation, friend. I'm talking about now the saint of God having fellowship with the Lord Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I'm telling you, friend, you draw nigh to him, he'll draw nigh to you. And when you draw nigh to him, confusion must flee. The word escape here means to slip away. And what David is saying when I have coveted thy habitation, when I have resorted regularly, resort means to get somewhere and take a rest and, 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 and relax, a general place you want to visit. 
Uh, for, for example, the man built a, house, a resort by the river, a nice place. How long's it been? There's been a general, a consistent visiting God. You put it all away. And David said, I promise you, you will escape confusion. What he means there is this, to slip away. You'll be so heavenly minded, so set on God and God's will and God's ways that when confusion presents itself, rather than lose it and nut up like some people do, rather than have a nervous breakdown and bite all your nails off, you just slip away. Just God just moves you right on past. You don't need this, son. You don't need any of this. Move on past. Uh Uh-uh, go this way. We got folk every day making lifelong decisions. And they don't even know why. They don't don't even know whether it's going to affect them uh, uh, temporarily or permanent. And I thought to myself, Brother Mark, Here this guy is. Think with me, if you will. Do you honestly believe if he knew that missing one Wednesday night service would change his life forever and his family's, that he'd have stayed home? That he'd have missed? Nobody. Oh, no, God, I can hear it now. Well, if I had another chance, this thing, I I won't go into detail, tormented him to suicide. That happened while he wasn't in the house of God. Tormented him. God wants you and I close to him. God wants us close to him. God wants us in the house of God. God wants us doing. And what happens is is this. When we come God's way and we accept God's will, God floods our hearts and our minds with prudence and wisdom and protection. And David said this. He said, I'll escape confusion because I've been resorting to the habitation of God. I'm not going to miss it. Now he goes on and says this. I love this text. For he is my rock. Oh me, what a text. He is my rock. And what David is saying there is this. Every aspect of my life, every part of my being is founded on the rock of ages, Christ himself. He's the rock under my feet. He's the foundation. And nothing will ever harm me because I've planted my feet on the rock of ages. Let's learn Jesus' ways. Matthew 7. In Matthew chapter 7, and I'm going to close right here. The Lord tells us much about what David means here about this rock. This rock that David is describing. Now, Verse 24 is where I want to go, but I want to read verse 21. Does everybody have it? Hey, it's tough wearing two pair of glasses. Pray for me that I'll get my sugar down. One, uh, they, these, the, the guy told me, the same fellow, he said, look, he said, diabetes, he said, it's hard to get a man in a good set of glasses. He said, because the sugar fluctuates so much. He says, I'll get one part right and another part go. So I got to put these like Coke bottle lenses on for a moment, okay? So (laughs) just bear with me. In chapter 7, verse 21, the Lord is going to 
define and unwrap what I mean about standing on this rock. Look what he says in verse 21. Not everyone, and we've got to keep it in its context, okay? That's why I'm reading verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Who said that? But he that doeth the will of my Father, oh me, oh me. You telling me that Christ just said the only people that are going to heaven are those that do God's will? I'm telling you the Bible said that. Don't look at me dumbfounded. Some of you look confused. Keep reading. Not everyone that saith unto me shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Let's keep reading. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wondrous works. Watch it, verse 23 is a key verse. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. What a sad phrase. I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. He's comparing iniquity to God's will. Do you see that? If it had been doing God's will and been saved, it wouldn't have been doing iniquity. That's the way I read it. Let's keep going. This is why verse 24 starts with therefore. Who is he talking about? Who, before we read verse 24, who is he talking about? People who have not done the will of God. Amen. People who are, he's going to tell to depart. Now watch it. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, and doeth them, I will liken unto him a wise man. If you do God's will, he's going to call you wise. Watch it. Isn't, it. isn't it wise to do the will of God? I will liken unto him as a wise man which built his house, watch it, upon a rock. Now watch this. Here comes confusion to one of God's children. Watch it. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon the house and it fell not for it was founded Upon a rock. Oh, me. <laughs> Brother Chuck, that means I can't even mess it up. <laughs> if I just decide that everything I do, every part of my being, all of my life, has to do with God and God's will, I can't even mess it up, Brother Greg. Let's keep reading. Look in verse 26. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell. Watch it. And great was the fall of it. Brother Greg read the next verse in Sunday school this morning. Did you know what? I understand primarily he's referring to someone that needs to be saved here and they're not falling off into hell. But there is the thought of falling into confusion and a child of God not making the right decisions through life, not escaping confusion because of his or her pride, or let me say it this way, willful sin. Bless God, it's my life. I'm going to live how I want. I'm going to do what I want. You're entitled to do that, and I'm entitled to do that. We will not escape confusion when it comes, though, friend. We've got to be founded on the rock. Now, here's what I want you to know is this. There's going to be uncertain times, aren't they, in life? There's going to be difficult times. 
difficult times in life. You're going to face them more than likely than I'm going to. I've faced them. They're hard. They're tough. I can remember in one of the lowest times in my life, God using Psalm 91, Dr. Ralph Sexton Jr. preached a message entitled God's 911 number. Psalm 91 and verse 1. Under his wings. And he was talking about, just before, did you find it, my brother? He was talking about the message that's in his song that I'm going to play for an invitation. When a child of God is under God's wings, David said he's not only, look, my rock, but he's my fortress. Let me just say here what that means. Any outside interference, any outside thing that will try to destroy or harm God's people or David, David said God is my fortress. He's my wall of protection. He's my bright and morning star. And I can claim it all because I've received him and made him the foundation of my life. And I stand on the solid rock this morning. One of the worst times in my life, God, you just phone. I want you to stand with me this morning. And before he plays this song, I want heads bowed and eyes are closed. I got a question. Here it is. Different invitation. When's the last time you've been with him? Maybe this morning, just in obedience to the Holy Spirit and in adoration to the King of Heaven, when he begins to play this song, you'll move in appreciation for all that the Savior's done for you. And you love him. And maybe now's the time to come in his presence. Maybe now's the time to kneel publicly in his presence and say, Lord, I thank you that I've placed my feet on the solid rock and I'll never be denied heaven. You've given me the ability to read the word of God, the precious Bible, and follow the life of the Son of God that I might escape confusion. I'll just kneel in reverence this morning in gratitude. As he plays this song, if you need to come, I want you to come. Listen now. You might need to come. My way was filled with danger. singled me out to do me wrong and when he drew near my heart filled with fear then I heard someone dear calling me to his side and I read that I'm under my Lord's wings. Under His wings. Thunder rolled, dark clouds on low. I was out in a storm. Shivering in the cold mist there. No sail. There were strong winds, would this be my end? And then I heard my friend calling me to his side. house. 
Such a beautiful and song. The storm still I don't know, many of you might not be aware of it. The best of my knowledge, a lady over here in Ringo wrote that song from Psalm 91. Man, I'm glad I'm a part of God's family. I'm under his wings. You go ahead and be seated. Uh, we'll have a business meeting real quickly. And uh, shouldn't be too long. Do I